Good day and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture is supported by the UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and by a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It's my honor and privilege to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Jessica Turner, Associate Professor of Psychology from Georgia State University. She completed her Bachelor of Arts degree um, in psychology and mathematics from Swarthmore College, uh, a Master's of Arts in Social Sciences from the University of California, Irvine in 1992, and in 1997, completed her PhD in psychology from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she has been an assistant professor in residence at the, uh, Cal Irvine, and from 2010 to 2013, an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, where she was part of the Translational Neuroscience uh, Mind Research Network in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, since um, uh, uh, but presently, she has been an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Georgia State uh, University in Atlanta. And under the direction of Professor Turner, her lab investigates the genetics underlying brain structural changes in chronic schizophrenia, as well as the genetic influences on functional and structural neuroimaging um, measurements in many other neuropsychological uh, disorders and, and diseases. Uh, she has a particular focus on the development of formal computable representations of neuroimaging experiments, the experimental variables involved and the results of data from automated data sharing and meta-analyses within neurobiology. All of her work is conducted in close collaboration with psychiatrists, computer scientists, geneticists, and neuroscientists um, in research on the genetics of brain function and dysfunction. She has uh, been a key participant and contributor to several large scale NIH funded programs in brain research, notably the Biomedical Informatics Research Network um, Coordinating Center, uh, the Skits Connect Project, as well as many others. And her lecture today is entitled Enigma and Coin Stack Turning Small Data Sets into Big Ones. As always, we are streaming this lecture live for, for recording via YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2020-2021 uh, Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Turner via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during about the last 10 minutes or so of Dr. Turner's lecture. And with that, welcome, Jess. Thank you so much. We are really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. And here we are. Um, move on through it. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this presentation today. I want to talk about um, really a culmination and, or the current stage <laughs> uh, of a long progress of creating big data sets from smaller ones. Um, there's been a long history in neuroimaging of which uh, Dr. Van Horn has been was a key player in helping neuroimaging uh, researchers to share their data, to take data sets from individual studies um, so that they could be combined, considered, compared um, in ways that you can't if you just look at the literature. So today I wanted to talk about two efforts that have been um, ongoing in this progress over the last uh, decade. Um, one of which is the Enigma um, effort and its working groups, which is a largely human dependent um, approach to large scale data sharing and analysis. And one of which is CoinStack, which is a more automated approach. And these two groups have actually gotten together, which is why I have an Enigma CoinStack uh, presentation to talk to you about. So for those of you who don't know Enigma, for those of you who do, I'm gonna apologize that about half the talks about um, Enigma and its history. Um, Enigma stands for Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics Through Meta-Analysis. It was really started in 2009. It was uh, largely the brainchild of Dr. Paul Thompson, uh, now at USC. And at that time, um, hard to believe as it was, but if you cast your mind back <laughs> to uh, the early 2000s, those of us who are trying to put together brain measurements, neuroimaging and genetics um, really had a hope that if we could get to 200, 500, maybe a thousand subjects um, that we would be able to identify genetic effects on brain measurements um, more very robustly. 
Um, and it and it was becoming very clear that that wasn't the case, that we were going to take um, thousands of subjects, in, which is larger than any one person can collect. And uh, Paul's real stroke of genius was to recognize that we could actually um, leave the data where it is. Um, so everybody had data sets of 100 people, 200 people, um, <clears throat> which we thought were astoundingly large for neuroimaging. Um, but they weren't large enough. Uh, and the idea would be, could we actually um, just interact with everybody who has those data, who has genetic data, genome wide scan data, and uh, brain imaging data, and have everybody do the same analysis. So voluntarily um, agree to do the same analysis on their own data, and then aggregate those results for a meta-analysis. And that way, we don't have to jump through all the hoops of data sharing. We don't have to jump through all the hoops of moving the data so that you have 10,000 data sets in one university's um, uh, resources, but we just send summary results back and forth. And there's a huge um, lowering of the bar when people, when you say, oh, I don't have to give you my data. I just have to do some analysis and we can actually, um, we can actually put it together and do a meta-analysis. But it's not the same as a literature meta-analysis because it is a prospective, what we call a prospective meta-analysis because everybody does the same analysis as opposed to reading the literature and doing everybody, you know, perhaps have done, having done their own idiosyncratic analysis and, and published it. So it avoids the heterogeneity of an analysis, uh, heterogeneity of analysis that you get from a sort of standard uh, literature-driven meta-analysis. And it also avoids to some extent the, um, the, the file drawer problem where a uh, data that's too small that doesn't find a significant result doesn't get published and you never know about it. Um, so in this case, we're really asking people to reach into their file drawer and reuse their own data. Um, and it turned out that he got a huge response. He literally just emailed, you know, friends and uh, friends and family, and uh, shipped it around his his imaging uh, networks and imaging genetics networks, and had a, a positive response from quite a few uh, people. So in two thousand and twelve, these were the the groups from around the country who were participating in the first um, analyses. By two thousand and fourteen, it had grown tremendously. And more recently, um, it's now at 43 countries, researchers across 43 uh, countries. It's organically organized into 51 working groups um, and 31, uh, or around 31 different disorders. Um, and it's just uh, really taken off. So from its original analyses, which were literally genome-wide association studies of subcortical um, methods, so they had uh, a group working on how do we actually standardize the subcortical protocol so that everybody can do it? Um, how do we do the genetics in such a way that we can do the meta-analysis appropriately afterwards? That was sort of the first, the first start. Since then, there have been many, many groups working on different uh, interactions of genetics and imaging, different um, aspects of genetics, um, epigenetics, et cetera. How do we actually deal with that? How do we collaborate with other uh, imaging genetics groups that maybe are not part of, of Enigma but are doing their own thing? Within the imaging, there've been a huge number of imaging protocols suitable for multi-site meta-analysis and mega-analysis that have been uh, developed. Um, the initial analyses sort of ignored disorder, um, even though many of the studies which were participating in the meta-analysis had collected their data because they were interested in schizophrenia or bipolar disorder attention deficit. Um, once the first papers came out, the again, a sort of self-organization occurred uh, whereby working groups um, who were part of the original analysis but now wanted to focus on schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, et cetera, grew up. And then those have expanded now into, again, over, over 30 different disorders that are using these same sorts of models uh, to exam examine neuroimaging in their disorder, as well as other questions that are perhaps not disease related, um, maturation over the lifespan, changes over a shorter period of time, lateralization, et cetera. Um, now, the reason Enigma can be um, so uh, successful is it was, um, in many cases, really dependent on previously existing informatics or easy informatics to um, 
to implement. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with neuroimaging, FreeSurfer is a piece of software that's been around for probably 30 years that has been used to analyze structural images to look at gray and white matter uh, volumes and shape and other kinds of measures. And they have used the same directory structure since the early 90s um, to store the inputs and outputs of their data. So that was highly standardized, not optimized, but highly standardized. And everybody knew how to work with them. So we could easily write scripts that would work with these directory trees, pull out the measurements that we really want, which could then be automated using, in our the original cases, it was all R scripts that could run on anybody's system to do the regression, zip it all up and ship it back to the central site for a meta-analysis. Um, so completely dependent on people making sure that they could run FreeSurfer, run the scripts, run the R scripts, but these R scripts could be uh, standardized across everybody's sites for um, a standard analysis. We all would agree on exactly what regressions we want to do, et cetera. Um, so in the first paper from 2012, uh, they ended up looking at data from 13,000 um, subjects. This was really the first success uh, of Enigma in many ways, looking at uh, human hippocampal and intracranial volumes and the entire genome or genome-wide association study and identifying regions um, in the hippocampus that didn't quite hit, um, even with 13,000 <laughs> data points, didn't quite hit significance. Um, but uh, it did seem to be identifying uh, areas that were related to genes, which are important in brain development. Um, very nice kind of results. And the important thing um, for me, the, the reason that I'm such a fan of the Enigma approach is really shown here in this forest plot, where what you're seeing is every site that contributed data to the, to the first meta-analysis and the effect, uh, the effect size and a confidence interval for that data set for that locus and, and hippocampal volume. And you can see that individually, no site reaches significance. None of these results would ever have been published in the literature as being genome-wide um, association significant in any way. But the trend is very consi surprisingly consistent um, across all of the data sets. So that when you look at the consensus results in a meta-analysis, you really see that there, there seems to be an effect there. And the lovely thing about it was not only do they do one in meta-analysis, but they did two um, using a similar uh, number of subjects. And the, the, meta, the uh, replication showed exactly the same sort of result leading to um, a very exciting uh, finding. And then of course they could uh, replicate that and extend it. The next paper in 2015 that looked at all of the subcortical brain structures included data from 30,000 30, participants around the world. And uh, excitedly, it sort of turned out that the, the hippocampus is not where we should have been looking. The putamen is really where the strong genetic effects, um, just outstandingly strong genetic effects uh, were found when you had the power to really um, aggregate this data and these results and look at it across um, 30,000 subjects. And of course, more recently now up to 50,000 subjects and they're able to do the same analysis across the entire uh, cerebral cortex, looking at all of the uh, brain regions there and identifying um, genome-wide uh, significant effects on, on um, uh, cortical gray matter thickness and other measurements. So of course, these, uh, this approach is imminently scalable. You've, I've already shown that um, we've bro been broken up into uh, working groups. Well, uh, shall we say loosely organized into working groups because many people, of course, have multiple um, transdiagnostic interests and participate in multiple of these uh, research groups. Um, but each one of the groups has uh, looked at case control differences using these approaches, um, aggregating results from around the world to identify where do we see case control effects across the cortex and the subcortex. Um, and, how do, and now we can say, how does that actually relate um, across the different disorders? Um, so that we have major depression, bipolar disorder, uh, Theo Van Erp and I run the uh, schizophrenia working group. Um, and you can see, of course, that you can compare very nicely the cortical pattern of results um, across these different disorders. And each of these papers and um, analyses really pulls from thousands of cases and controls around the world, uh, really helping to nail down these effects and effect sizes um, in, these, in these disorders. 
Of course, not everything is gray matter. Our first analyses really uh, dependent on, on free surfer and FSL for, for their analysis. But of course, there's also diffusion tensor imaging data, resting state functional uh, imaging data, and uh, the, the latest uh, development effort is in a pipeline for analyzing magnetic resonance spectroscopy results across multiple um, sites and studies. And again, remember, all of this data is collected um, long before it's analyzed for uh, an Enigma approach. These are all data sets in all of these um, studies that are previously collected. So they were collected as best fit the needs of the people running those studies at the time, as best fit the abilities of whatever scanning centers they were using at the time. So they are highly heterogeneous um, data collection methods, neuroimaging uh, parameters, et cetera. And so half the challenge in developing an Enigma pipeline is really identifying what is it that we can do to address the heterogeneity across these techniques, the, sam the different techniques using these samples that somehow main maintains the effect sizes and the sensitivity across the samples. We don't wanna just wipe out any effects that we might be finding, but at the same time, we don't wanna introduce artifact. Um, so briefly, uh, this is an example from 2013, uh, introducing the Enigma DTI pipeline where they had access to multiple family studies and they could uh, identify that the, heter the heritability of white matter um, was the same when it was run through the Enigma DTI pipeline, whether they did a meta-analysis or a mega-analysis, they didn't introduce any artifacts and the, the overall pattern of results was very similar across the different white matter tracks, which gave us um, some confidence that this DTI pipeline was what we wanted. Um, and then the schizophrenia groups, the bipolar groups, and the major depression groups have all published the white matter case control effects using this pipeline. Um, and in a, a recent paper that just came out, <clears throat> uh, maybe I think this past month, um, the working with a Japanese consortium. So the Kokoro Consortium is an, uh, a Japanese version of Enigma where they have their own multi-site um, data set aggregation and analysis approach for meta-analysis. And they basically used the Enigma pipeline and looked at their schizophrenia samples and looked at the, um, the, what the, the effect sizes that they were finding and how that correlated with the effect size that the Enigma schizophrenia um, group had already published. And as you can see, there's a whoppingly high correlation. So it's highly rep, uh, reproducible in these case control effects across different parts of the white matter in international um, samples. Bipolar disorder, um, also a very high correlation, not as tight as in schizophrenia and in major depression, still a good correlation, but um, weaker probably due to the, the heterogeneity of, of depression. I always thought schizophrenia was a highly heterogeneous um, disorder, but it's got nothing on, on major depression, which is just incredibly um, uh, different in its different, different presentations. So given that Enigma has hit 10 years, um, there's actually a special issue um, all about Enigma, um, looking at sort of a 10 year retrospective uh, that just came out in human brain mapping uh, quite uh, recently, I think almost now that may be out in two, two different um, issues. And it's covering um, over 30 papers. So there's really quite a lot there. You could spend the whole year just reading your way through um, this, this issue. And in many cases, it really falls under three themes. One is looking at working groups and what they have done, either some of the newer working groups such as epilepsy or, um, or stroke recovery, which is uh, some of the newer working groups or comparisons across the different working groups. So the ADHD and the autism groups have been working together more recently. And it's a review of what, what they've been doing and what they've been finding, et cetera. There are a number of methods papers. So what do we know about the DTI pipeline? What have we been able to um, use it to find out? Comparing meta versus mega analysis. So what do we see when we do a meta analysis versus actually pull all the data together into one location? Um, reproducibility questions. And then empirical findings, either from uh, using the Enigma approach, um, such as looking at uh, subcortical shape, shape alterations, or trying to apply Enigma findings um, in the, the uh, smaller clinical non-Enigma data sets. Some of the newer disease groups have really um, tackled the heterogeneity of their diseases um, 
And these more recent papers are showing that. So for example, with schizophrenia, we know that schizophrenia is a highly heterogeneous disorder, but in our analyses, we could basically say, look, everybody's either schizophrenic or they're not. They've got the diagnosis or they don't. And we're just gonna roll with that and look at what we can find just to get the, get the ball rolling. Um, we've looked at some symptom severity profiles, et cetera. But in epilepsy and stroke, and epilepsy, of course, um, the locus of where the epileptic or the foci of the epileptic seizures could be in very different places around the brain in different data sets. Um, stroke uh, studies, of course, stroke can be in very different parts of the brain, and they really had to tackle the heterogeneity of their data and how are they going to put that together in these large-scale meta-analyses. The anxiety working group had to deal with the organization of anxiety disorders. They didn't just focus on a particular anxiety disorder, so they really took to heart that within anxiety, you have general anxiety, and then you've got the um, social anxiety and phobic anxieties and other anxieties, and they wanted to break to say, try to tease apart what is specific to anxiety and what is specific to the different disorders, or what is general <laughs> to anxiety and what is specific to the different um, anxiety subdivisions, if you will. It's very interesting reading and, and approaches there. Um, one of the translations of um, the Enigma findings to the clinic is the Regional Vulnerability Index that uh, Peter Kochanoff and his team uh, have identified. And it really takes advantage of the fact that all of the Enigma findings are uh, downloadable. Um, so across, for example, the schizophrenia findings we have for every brain region from the free surfer, free surfer cortical output, we know what the uh, case control effect size is and what its confidence uh, range is. So we have a profile, if you will, of what the schizophrenic um, effects are across the brain. And we can apply this to any data set, um, any neuroimaging data set that you might have, where if you start with your controls, you can get sort of the mean um, for your sample, what is the mean thickness or measurement, for example, of, of um, every brain region in this parcellation? You can then, for each subject, look at how they deviate from your controls. Um, so for your, your controls are going to obviously have some variability um, around the mean and your patients, if you have individuals with schizophrenia, um, will also deviate from the mean of the, of the healthy controls. And so every subject now has a sort of vector of z-scores showing whether, where they are uh, deviating from the mean and by how much. And of course, you can then correlate that with um, the Enigma schizophrenia findings across these same regions so that uh, the regional vulnerability index is the correlation um, of between their regional z-scores and the Cohen's d-scores across the region. So a higher correlation means that their pattern of thickness deviations from the norm is more similar to what we've seen in case control differences in the worldwide sample which is a lovely idea and what can you do with it? And what um, Peter's team did was say, well, we have you know, 120 or 200 um, patients and a bunch of controls and we can look within the patients at those who are earlier in their disorder or intermediate in their disorder or those who've had the disorder for, for many decades and look at their subcortical measures, their cortical measures, their white matter, and they actually came up with a way to do a regional vulnerability index um, that combined um, all of these measures. And they could show that they're basically their controls um, have no regional regional vulnerability. Patients do have um, a regional vulnerability across all modalities, so they correlate with what's been seen in these worldwide um, samples. And in subcortically and in white matter, you can actually see effects across the duration of illness so that patients who are sort of early in their diagnostic stage look you know, a little bit more like healthy controls than the, do the folks um, who are more chronic in all cases. And the substance abuse um, disorders working group also looked at a very similar kind of approach saying we have our own patterns of findings in substance use. How does that compare to the psychiatric disorders? Where do we see a similar pattern? Where do we not? Um, so Enigma, of course, people always ask, how do I join up? How do I get involved? Um, if you have imaging data that is relevant to any of the questions um, that any of the working groups are, are looking at, whether it's disorder related or methodology related, et cetera, um, just you can, you can uh, 
uh, talk to the chair of the of the working group and and get involved. Usually, people are affiliated with some data set, either directly or indirectly. Um, if you have a method that you're interested in trying out, generally speaking, um, many of the working groups are very open to that. We've certainly seen folks from you know bipolar or PTSD working groups come over to schizophrenia and say, hey, we're finding this really interesting thing in these other groups. Can we try it in schizophrenia, even though they themselves don't have schizophrenia data? Um, and sometimes <clears throat> if you have a, an interesting question, you can certainly make a connection within the relevant um, Enigma working group. I have had people come to me and say, oh, I can I get access to the Enigma data because I want to do this or the other thing. I have a new approach. And usually the response is, look, make a connection with someone who has the relevant data show us how it's being done on that particular data set and then you'll you'll get um, the working group leaders and the data set um, liaison sort of going sure i'm happy to give it a shot on on my data uh, but you want to sort of you don't want to just walk up and say i can't hand you the data um, for enigma because everybody controls their own um, within the uh, large-scale enigma analysis of course we've identified Privacy issues, one of the reasons um, Enigma exists is so we don't have to actually give away our data. And within that uh, special issue, Vince Calhoun um, has written a paper about the software he's been developing specifically to address the issues of privacy within um, uh, the data sharing uh, drive within the neuroimaging community. So Vince Calhoun, who's now at Georgia State has been developing the Collaborative Informatics and Neuroimaging Suite Toolkit for anonymous computation or coin stack. Um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a collaborative uh, informatics and neuroimaging suite. So it's a data management data um, processing uh, uh, suite of tools um, that is now available for anonymous um, collaborative computation. So the idea is very much like the Enigma model, um, uh, someone can install the coin stack software um, link it up to the data that they have available and collaborate with other people around the world who want to do these same kinds of analyses on similar kind of data without having to actually upload your data or send it to everybody you want to collaborate with, etc. Um, it allows, obviously, researchers from around the world to collaborate. With a, the automated approach, it can now include decentralized um, learning algorithms, advanced statistical and machine learning analyses, um, so that you don't, you can do iterative algorithms, iterative computations, which previously had required that all the data be in one place so that you can iterate over it. Uh, because certainly the human driven approach that we've used in um, Enigma largely is not conducive to, to shipping information back and optimizing parameters, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you only get one shot. Um, but with these automated approaches, you can have the, you can now decentralize your iterative algorithms and, um, and apply them without transmitting individual level data. And you can incorporate differentially private computations in the software level so that you can protect against malicious um, attacks that might be trying to reconstruct your data and get at the privacy information um, that you're trying to hide. So we have we can actually work in privacy protection at that level. Um, and currently it is, of course, open source, free software, um, easily extensible. It's based in Docker. It'll run computations in R, Python, MATLAB, et cetera. And it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Obviously, there's still a lot to do with it. Um, but basically, the lead site um, defines the local um, analysis that will be run locally and the global analysis that would be run at the lead site when it gets all the results back in the kind of uh, automation of the Enigma approach. The participating sites basically can see exactly how their data is being used. They're not giving up control of their data in any way. They agree to allow their data to be used. They then uh, join the consortium, get the um, analyses that are supposed to be done. And when everything's ready, the lead site actually fires off the analysis, which is then run automatically at every site, no postdocs required, and, um, and returns the intermediate data to the lead site. We have implemented, of course, regression, as well as these decentralized, uh, uh, more interesting kinds of algorithms, perhaps including uh, deep learning and independent components analysis and support vector machines, et cetera, and of course, um, we've bundled up the R scripts to try to do uh, replications of the Enigma analyses. And so uh, Vince and Theo Van Erp and I have 
sort of put together the Enigma Schizophrenia and CoinStack uh, efforts and were recently uh, funded or actually was funded last year to ask questions about um, Enigma schizophrenia or really about schizophrenic brain measures and uh, negative symptoms. So within schizophrenia, we were very interested in um, negative symptoms. We already had papers out looking at across the Enigma Schizophrenia Working Group, looking at negative symptoms and cortical thickness and had total negative symptom severities related to various areas in the inferior frontal cortex. But that's really not the final word. We know that uh, structure and white matter and function probably all play a role in identifying um, what's going on with negative symptoms. And with the coin stack interactions and the coin stack infrastructure, we could look at each one of these individually against uh, the negative symptom measures. We could look at multivariate combinations of these different measures. And we can, of course, lead to um, machine learning approaches to try to predict from combinations of these features what the negative symptoms are that any given patient is suffering from. And then we could try to generalize that by interacting with the Enigma bipolar disorder group, getting them to do the same sorts of analyses, and then generalize that to major depression to see whether the negative symptoms, the anhedonia, apathy, et cetera, um, play a role in what we see in major depression or, really, or whether um, the psychosis disorders are very different. So within schizophrenia, there are actually um, very different uh, negative symptom profiles uh, across men and women. Um, generally speaking, women seem to be more affected, women with schizophrenia seem to be more affected by uh, mood and, and depressive symptoms and the affect um, the affective symptoms, whereas men generally tend to have more severe negative symptoms, apathy, anhedonia, withdrawal uh, of all sorts, but it's not specific to um, mood disorders. And so we use this as an initial um, examination within the CoinStack framework to say, can we just look at sex differences in our negative symptoms uh, measurements across a number of different sites. So we had, uh, as a first test, we had seven different sites that it collected, as you can see, very small samples, <laughs> 30, 20, 30 subjects, um, each with a breakdown of men and women um, uh, participants, same general age, duration of illness, varying from very early in their um, duration of a very short duration of illness to very long duration of illness at every site. Um, the SANS is the scales for the assessment of negative symptoms. And again, within each site, there's really quite a range from um, individuals with really no negative symptoms, where most of their symptoms might have been more of the positive symptoms like hallucinations, but they didn't have a lot of the negative symptoms of withdrawal and apathy and blunted affect, et cetera. And then there are other people uh, within each site that had uh, quite severe negative symptoms. And so we could actually run across, we could use the coin stack, coin stack infrastructure to run a um, factor analysis on the different negative symptoms and look at the sex differences across um, the negative symptom factors. Um, and then we could look at the meta-analysis. And then we said, so we basically, what would have taken um, a few months of rolling things out to individual sites we could do over the course of, of an hour um, by just uh, setting it up and, and letting it run automatically. Um, we did a hierarchical factor analysis for those of you who are interested in sort of the nitty gritty of our negative symptoms. There's a two factor uh, solution, which is um, motivation and expressiveness. Um, and then there's a five factor solution that's really embedded in the two factor solution. And what we were seeing was generally speaking, um, men had more severe negative symptoms uh, relative to women. And th this was really only significant in the expressive um, factor and then factors four and five, which dealt with, which really contributed to the expressive factor show the same pattern. So we're, this is very nice in that we're replicating what's been seen in the literature and pr particularly in large scale um, analyses where they aggregated all the data and ran it all together. We could actually, um, run this in an automated system and get what we expect to see. Um, and then we can step forward and say, okay, we did that. We've got our coin stack system working. Let's look at brain volumes because what do we see with our negative symptoms and, and brain measurements? And again, using 
um, the coin stack infrastructure and some of the sites couldn't do that. So they would have to run it themselves and we'd put it all together. But um, using the coin stack infrastructure, we could look at um, avolition and anhedonia, which are two of the uh, negative symptoms of schizophrenia that are considered to be related to sort of positive valence, um, sort of positive emotions. It's sort of a lack of positive emotions, avolition and anhedonia. And then uh, deficits in social processing, which is asociality or blunted um, uh, withdrawal from social interactions, blunted affect and, um, and, and no, no talking basically, elogia. And we could again, use these analyses to do exactly the same sorts of analyses. I was actually expecting to see a lot of the uh, inferior frontal regions being related to negative symptoms as we see here, because that is what we had seen in previous analyses um, when we looked at just total symptom severity as opposed to breaking it down and seeing which negative symptoms were related um, to the brain regions. Because it turns out the positive valence seems to be related to um, the areas that we were seeing before, but the social processing has a very different um, pattern and it's really fantastic to be able to, to look at this. We're still wrapping this up. This is um, sort of initial uh, primary results. We have a few more sites that are coming in um, for analysis. And of course, our next developments are just to say, we, you know, we know that structure is just the beginning of the question. We're working on the DTI analysis similarly and resting state and then put it all together because the test will be, can we actually um, use these brain measures to really predict the different negative symptom um, uh, profiles that we have across uh, different individuals in these um, uh, data sets. So in summary, a few minutes here. Um, so large scale data management and particularly management of access to the data for data sharing, um, as well as methods for large scale data analysis and meta analysis are really becoming de rigueur, if you will, in our, in our imaging, certainly more, much more common. Um, the analyses are becoming more powerful and more nuanced over time. The heterogeneity of the disorders um, can really be attacked with these kinds of large scale approaches. Um, combinations of meta and mega analysis can be very uh, informative. Again, meta analysis is where you leave the data in one place. Mega analyses uh, is usually where you have to combine the data. There are approaches for performing what is effectively a mega analysis in a decentralized um, environment. So that's very promising because um, it is really the best of both worlds. Structural, functional, and DTI analysis pipelines are currently available with others uh, coming. Um, and novel approaches, of course, to these decentralized analyses are becoming available and very powerful for being able to um, really access uh, federated or decentralized data um, to be able to um, get the power of these large scale data sets without pulling it all together and having to invest in uh, massive data repositories. Um, the initial re results from Enigma, all of their working groups are, are public and can be reused. The initial code from uh, CoinStack is available on our GitHub uh, site and it's in uh, these slides as well. Uh, this allows for comparisons across disorders and diagnostic boundaries and it allows for um, prediction and classic classification techniques without uh, data sharing when you put Enigma um, data access and, and coin stack techniques together. Um, so that's hopefully uh, the beginnings of, of the future for these kinds of analyses. So in conclusion, um, I do wanna again address and remind everybody of the key issues of the power that comes from these kinds of questions, the computational efficiency that comes from these kinds of approaches and shared um, data access, shared data uh, considerations um, it really pushes open science and reproducibility um, forward because these meta-analyses in particular with the forest plots really highlight the variability across different data sets and what you might expect to see if you run it yourself on your own data set. Um, it of course is pushing team science um, forward and of course advancing science um, by interacting together to try to answer the same question once and for all as opposed to having to do it uh, multiple times and argue about it um, in, in the literature per se. So we can of course download GitHub. Um, so I wanted to make sure everybody has access to that information. We're very happy to hear from you if you download it and try to run it or want to get involved. Um, and I did want to acknowledge both the NSF and the NIH support that has gone into 
um, all of these efforts. I didn't include all of the Enigma, <laughs> uh, Enigma grants, but certainly the ones that have inter interacted with uh, CoinStack. This is uh, Vince's teams, many of whom are working on developing these algorithms and, and software, as well as other questions. This is my lab um, at Georgia State, many of whom are interacting with uh, the Enigma approaches. And this is um, a group of the Enigma, a subset, if you will, of the Enigma working group uh, leaders getting together for their annual meeting um, before the Organization for Human Brain Mapping uh, meeting in 2019, back when we could actually all get together and, and stand together. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to do that again in the future. So thank you very much. Dr. Turner, thank you so much for that great overview of Enigma and CoinStack and its uh, several examples of their application um, that have led to some pretty prominent um, peer-reviewed literature. Uh, that's fantastic. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to invite our um, uh, uh, Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab attendees uh, to uh, submit questions via their uh, chat feature in Zoom. Um, and while those are accumulating, Jess, I'd like to ask you a couple of things uh, while we wait. Um, so it looks like Enigma has solved many of the sociological issues that are involved in data sharing and certainly promotes uh, uh, open science and collaboration. Uh, I'm curious if you've also solved the cat herding problem of getting all those people to do things in a timely fashion and answer emails and uh, <laughs> what, what's some of the what's some of the, the the coordination that has to go in to having um, some of these uh, multi-site, multi-country, multi-time zone collaborations. Well, you know, there, there's there's an entire book that could probably be written about lessons learned from trying to run these <laughs> large scale <laughs> techniques. Um, and I'm sure anybody who's done it, whether it's in neuroimaging or geoscience or whatever, would have would have similar approaches. Um, but no, we have not solved the cat herding problem. And in, in many cases, and I, I can speak as somebody who's been um, uh, running the working group for probably longer than I should. Uh, in many cases, uh, the, the energy of the, of the people who have joined more recently um, is embarrassing to those of us who've been around for a while and are starting to slow down and not be able to uh, focus on these, these uh, analyses quite as much as, as we should like to. Um, so no, I think a lot of it has to do with having, um, well, it, it, there's a number of things. One is we, we found that co-chairing working groups is really important. No one person can do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And having two people sort of, you know, keeps it's it is a bit of cat herding, but at the same time, it's a bit like having cats that play together. <laughs> you know, they're much more likely to to stay healthy if they're not doing it on their own and feeling like it's all on, on their own. So I strongly recommend um, anybody who's starting up a group like this to have a team going into it as as leaders, and then. Um, there have been a number of graduate students and postdocs who have made Enigma projects their, their dissertation. Um, and I think to a person, they have all said that was probably slowing things down tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, not from the point of view of Enigma. Enigma was quite happy to see, you know, the larger groups were very happy to see um, somebody dedicated to these projects and actually getting papers out. And the papers have been very successful. Um, but each individual sort of said, I probably ended up taking a year or two longer with my dissertation than I would have if I had focused on something a little bit smaller. Um, and they basically recommend that you, you do this as a postdoc, but not necessarily as a graduate student. Yeah, I was going to ask about the use of Enigma as a device for undergraduate, graduate, or, you know, postdoctoral education. And I was curious uh, if, you know, about examples of that. It sounds like there's some graduate students who do this. Is this something that you have guys have considered kind of broadening to cover more of the spectrum, educational spectrum? Um, no, because it's hard enough to keep it moving, much less <laughs> turn it into anything else. Sure. Um, but no, I think it's, it's a really a brilliant idea. I certainly have brought people in, in my lab as, as graduate students, a number of them are working on, you know, learning R and trying to turn these analyses into R and what does it take to actually um, work with these kinds of international consortia. And I know other groups have written um, graduate uh, basically uh, funding grants to try mm -hmm. to fund um, uh, graduate students to work on it. We don't have a, a coordinated R25, for example, like you have or anything like that, but I think that's probably something we should um, we should consider. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, one of the questions that uh, is, is coming in is uh, about the 
um, kind of geographic diversity and ethnic diversity that you have in Enigma. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems that a, a lot of the data are coming from uh, European yes. and people of European and ancestry and whether or not there's any interest in including other populations or performing kind of trans ethnic oh, meta analyses. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at our maps, I mean, every time we got, you know, we got um, researchers on new continents or new countries, yeah. uh, there was always a, a, a celebration. Um, and it's been, it's been very interesting trying to work with people from around the world. I think obviously from the point of view of the genetics, um, Europe and the US sort of had a running start on that. Um, China, Japan, and many of the, the Asian countries certainly have whopping um, groups doing those analyses. Um, and they are much more open to doing meta analyses than to actually sharing the data. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that has certainly helped out a lot. And they were absolutely um, included in some of the more recent ones. The first, the first paper was largely Caucasian, um, but certainly as the genetic abilities for cross, um, cross racial, cross ethnic um, comparisons have gotten better. Um, that's sort of grown up hand in hand with worldwide um, Enigma genetics analyses. That's nice. Um, absolutely. I mean, Africa, unfortunately, many of the countries in Africa are still not at that point, um, but we're, we're looking forward to the day when, when we'll have dots all over that part of the world as well. That'd be fantastic. Now, you mentioned um, there was a lot of the work that you described was looking at the data from a meta-analytic point of view. And I mean, that's part of the way Enigma is structured is to look for um, kind of meta-analytic findings. Um, but you also mentioned that there are some mega-analytic tools mm -hmm. and uh, machinery that exists. And obviously, meta-analysis is going to be an analysis of those analyses, but getting all the raw data together is yeah. kind of a different scale of analysis. And it puts more of the onus on getting all that data into either one space or at least fewer spaces in order to kind of do it efficiently. What are some of the things which are happening uh, that uh, support mega analysis? Well, that's a, that's a great a great question. And it's it, over the last 10 years, there's been sort of ups and downs, if you will. Um, because certainly, as, as, as you noted, the, the meta-analytic approach was really what let Enigma get rolling because people said, oh, well, I can, I can do this. I don't have to give away my data. Um, and then there was a sort of pushback as some of the first papers came out. And of course, reviewers, you know, reviewer two always wants another analysis. Um, and that slows down <laughs> analysis, slows down paper responses when you have to now distribute your analyses to, you know, 30 places and, and get the results back and, and integrate it and revise the paper accordingly. Um, and so a number of the working groups said, can we start sharing data? Because literally for the purposes of writing the papers, <laughs> you know, to say when an analysis comes back, we need to be able to have access to the data very quickly to be able to run these analyses. Um, and what they were finding is that many of the groups were in the early days, so we're talking, you know, 2012, 2013, 14, uh, many of the groups were willing to share the free surfer output. So they could share, for example, the um, subject level, level volumes or, or measurements, but not the raw images. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they were doing mega analyses, they could get mega analyses at the level, at that level. So at the level of the spreadsheet, at the level of the um, the regional volumes or the tractography volumes, et cetera. Um, they could do that, but they couldn't necessarily share the, the raw images. Um, with the invocation of the GDPR, that's become more difficult. Sure. So they were just getting that up and rolling and becoming, you know, sort of the standard way of, of figuring that out. And then, then even the European countries said, no, sorry, we, we really have to, have to you know, pull back on that. Um, so in many cases, those of us who sort of stuck with the meta-analytic approach or focusing on CoinStack and these automated approaches um, have, have uh, sort of had to step in to say, you know, there's, there, there's still things we can do, the world isn't over, just because you can't share your raw data, we can put in this software layer that allows access to the data, allows access to these kinds of mega analyses we wanted to do without having to, um, well, while protecting everybody's privacy and confidentiality. What are some of the issues with the genetics data? Um, I guess it, this is probably all single where, nucleotide, where poly, <laughs> yeah, single nucleotide polymorphism data, yeah. um, and it, you know, presumably some of the data is you know older, using different chip technology, oh, yeah. and um, there's some there's some heterogeneity there, and of course, increasingly there's interest in getting you know full genome sequencing. 
how is, tell us a little bit more about that. What are some of the issues there and how do you expect things to change as people are starting to, you know, get gigabytes worth of oh, yeah. genome data? Well, let's, that is um, a, an area of active development. Okay. <laughs> for just the reasons that, that you've highlighted, because we're now looking at, you know, genome-wide association data was coming out in 2005, 2006. Um, and it's now 2020, you know? yeah. and, and so as you, yeah, this date there is incredibly heterogeneous um, genetic data, and a great deal. One of the reasons the first paper took three years to write was to figure out how to um, deal with that and how to how to. Um, do quality assurance on it when you you know you hand off code and everybody goes oh yeah yeah we're using the right build and oh yeah yeah we're doing this and we're doing that how do you actually make sure that they that it's been done in with some sort of objective measurement on the data um, how do you check for um, making sure that they don't have relatives in their sample or if they do you know that those have been taken into account properly so there's a huge amount of effort um, put into that and that's just as you pointed out for the single nucleotide polymorphism data um, and it just expands as you move into the newer um, techniques of uh, methylation uh, measurements and, and other kinds of, and whole genome sequencing, et cetera. So that is an area where that's one of the reasons the genomics um, working group is huge and they're collaborating with international genetics groups as well um, to try to develop methods that are robust to, you know, having an undergrad implement the scripts on your data set. Um, you want, you know, who doesn't have a dissertation in genetics behind them, but you can still make robust techniques that they can use. And it looks like there's also some working groups on epigenetics. Um, yes. And it looked like um, there might be some gene expression um, yes. activities going on as well. So Absolutely. it's not just the um, you know, the, the variation in ATCs and Gs, but their nope. uh, expression and any epigenetic factors, yeah. is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, it requires a huge amount of, of, you know, conversation and trial and error to get it right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those of us who are just still kind of coming to grips with, you know, genetics, uh, having to remember our biochemistry, it's just that whole, that whole side of things just keeps marching away from me personally. Oh, and I, it's, it's a it's, continual. It's unbelievable. I love my collaborations with the folks who really can focus on the genetics because they don't really care about the brain and how we measure the brain, but they can tell me everything about the latest and greatest understanding of how the structure of the chromosome and the way it's bent affects the, the expression of the gene. So you really, it's not just knowing the gene and how it correlates. You have to know where it is and you know what else is going on. It's absolutely remarkable. And in the second, I think I understand it and try to implement anything. Oh no, that's that's not how we do it. You, have, you haven't factored in the, I don't know, the, 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 the GC bias. And I got to take that into account. Oh, okay, great. I didn't, I didn't know about that. <laughs> Um, uh, one of our uh, attendees is asking, um, what specific areas are longitudinal studies um, which are being undertaken within Enigma? And um, this yeah. person, um, person is particularly interested in uh, sex difference uh, research across the lifespan into things like dementia risk. Is there things oh, uh, related to this um, from a longitudinal point yes, of view? Yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, Paul Thompson works closely with uh, Nada Jahanshad, at, also at USC, and Nada is running a um, grant, a very small grant on Enigma sex differences. Oh, super. Uh, where what she is doing is not actually running any analyses, but every group that does an analysis, we almost always include sex as a covariate, but it's a covariate of no interest. Um, we usually just want to account for it, but we don't really care about it. Mm -hmm. um, and what she's doing is saying, please send me your results. Anytime you include sex differences in your model, send me the results so we can look at the effects of sex differences and really try to put that all together in like this massive dashboard where you can integrate. Um, where do you see sex differences, whether it's in case control effects or in changes over time, because we do have longitudinal analyses going on or in symptom severity or what have you. No, uh, it's, and I'm that, happy to put anybody in touch with uh, with Nada if, if you're interested in working on something like that. That's great. Um, so you mentioned people who are interested in connecting with parts of the Enigma Consortium can reach out to the um, to the uh, uh, kind of subsection leaders, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. What would uh, somebody need to do to say write to you? What would, what would you need to see in order to say, okay, these guys might be uh, worth taking the risk on to, uh, <laughs> to partner with? Uh, we have a number of people who I'm sure are going to be very interested in. Sure, um, absolutely. Well, like one of the best places to start is to go to the Enigma website. Um, and I'm pretty sure I included that 
uh, early on in one of the slides, and I can happily send it to you, um, Jack, to, sure. to forward on if anyone wants to know. If you can't find it with Google, um, but there's if you go to the, the go to the website, we list who all the chairs are in the various working groups. Um, Paul Thompson has an absolutely phenomenal project manager who is sort of a central. Uh, emailing hub um, and many, many, many people will email um, Paul and Sophia Tomopoulos, who is the project manager um, and, uh, and say, I'm interested in joining. And she usually figures out where they need to go and who they need to talk to. Um, so I get an email from her probably once every, you know, every few months with something saying, oh, here's this group in Israel, here's this group in Buenos Aires or something. And then we reach out to them and say, hey, you know, what, what are you doing? What, what would you, why do you want to be involved? What, what are you, what are you looking at? And, um, and just double checking that they can really be a participant. Um, because um, ideally what I, as I was pointing out, if somebody comes in and says, oh, you know, I basically want to build my career on the backs of all the data that you have collected, um, we sort of go, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, hold sure. up, hold up. Um, but if somebody comes in and goes, hey, I've got, you know, 15 schizophrenics and 15 controls, I can't do anything with it, but I'm really interested in this question and here's what I'm doing and can I maybe roll these methods out to some of these other samples, um, we're, we're happy to chat with them. Absolutely happy to chat with them. That's fantastic. Now, uh, one final question is that there are a lot of different working groups which are very disease or disorder specific. Are there any sort of things which are trying to okay, look across the spectrum of things to kind of uh, identify commonalities which might exist between, I think you had mentioned an example like autism and ADHD, but you know, might you have something between you know, in other mental illnesses or other neurological conditions to look for some of these kind of more um, I'm, I'm thinking of things like the, the NIMH's um, efforts to kind of redefine how we think of, oh, yeah. of mental illness yeah. um, to kind of look at the, the actual um, uh, biomarker patterns and then ask whether or not those map onto what we think of as schizophrenia, for example. Are there activities going on like that? Yeah, absolutely. And Enigma is very open to supporting that kind of, um, of activity. I mean, the, the Enigma CoinStack grant is exactly taking advantage of NIH's um, desire to see cross-diagnostic questions so that we can start, we start by asking questions within schizophrenia and then seeing if it generalizes. Um, to bipolar disorder and major depression. That's the kind of thing that people want to see. Um, there is a cross disorder working group within bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression, and I think attention deficit disorder, but it may just be those first three, where we're really trying to compare results across groups and say, what, what is it that we're really seeing that is similar, that is different? Um, because there are even though there are similarities, there are of course disease specific effects such as um, the, the propensity within men and women. So we do see sex differences um, and just in, in um, how many <laughs> individuals you get uh, with schizophrenia versus bipolar. There are obviously differences in medication. There are differences in the trajectory of the disorder, but what, what does that do to the brain and, and how do we tease that apart? And what, what good does that tell us? Absolutely, there are folks doing that. Um, and then a number of those papers um, that I talked about in the OHBM uh, or in the HBM special issue are focusing on cross disorder groups. Much of that is organic. So we don't have a cross disorder working group per se. We sort of have a, an ad hoc <laughs> you know, effort between this group and that group or these three groups or those four groups based on common interests. That's really interesting. It would be uh, really kind of interesting to see kind of a enigma <laughs> just a big mega meta-analysis done yeah. using Enigma uh, to mm -hmm. look for brain commonalities and things which might be um, uh, uh, just kind of connect what we think of as yeah. distinct disorders, but are really kind of kind of different flavors of the same disorder, or alternatively, look for things where we think we understand that there are they're they're, they're called one thing, but right. they're actually multiple different sub disorders. Yeah, we really want to dig into that with these disorders that we know are just not uniform in any way, which is almost all of them. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, I. Uh, 
I think I've run out of questions and it looks like our, our participants have as well. So I wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Turner, for, for sharing with us uh, your work and the work of this impressive international team on Enigma and your work going on at uh, Georgia State um, to in uh, CoinStack and all of the activities going on there. That is very exciting. What a fantastic resource it has been constructed. I can't believe it's been 10 years that uh, Enigma has been around. I remember when it was a twinkle in uh, Paul Thompson's <laughs> eye. And, um, so it's uh, fantastic to see a success story uh, from uh, someone like him and yourself and all of your collaborators, uh, people I really respect and admire. So um, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I want to thank all of our uh, participants for, for joining in. If you are interested in anything Enigma, uh, you know where to go, um, and uh, as CoinStack as well. Uh, everyone, have a very good weekend. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks so much.